1077 KNYO LP streaming on the web at knyo.org. Way up on the fun side of the dial. Um, it's been a while, but it is five o'clock, and from five to six this evening, we're going to start off the Wagner Variety Show with an episode of Fort Bragg, USA. And I have Scott Peterson in the studio, an author of many fun, fun-filled things that we we slather all around the, the They're interwebs. They're fun for some people, yes. maybe not for others. Um, actually, I shared your latest, and it, people are already bent. But anyway, thanks for joining us <laughs> for another episode of Fort Bragg, USA. And how you been? I've been good. I've good. been good. And thank you for uh, helping this thing off the ground because um, I have been getting a lot of really good feedback that contributes to better content and more enjoyment for everybody and better consequences, better results for all these nonprofits. Yeah. And the nonprofits, you know, you're kind of holding some of their feet to the fire occasionally as far as bookkeeping and transparency in 990s. The 990 seems to be the biggest hit. It seems like... You sure get a lot of energy out of um, numbers that don't balance, I guess. Or tracking 990s from one year to the next and seeing like net assets. Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they staying flat? Uh, you know, when you see a nonprofit and suddenly like a third of its assets or did they disappear in one year, you have to go, whoa, what happened there? And a lot of people don't pay attention to their 990s. They have their bookkeeper file their 990s. They don't look at them. They don't have their board look at their 990s. So they don't really know yeah. what's going on. So somebody like me comes along and says, what about this? And they're going, oh, what's that? You know, <laughs> stay away. It's a public nonprofit. Stay away. Yeah. Well, and um, and sometimes you just get shut down if you bring up that kind of information. I.e. <laughs> like there was a particular meeting at the senior center where this one guy showed up with some big poster boards with some fancy graphics <laughs> and three minute rule. You know? Yeah, well, you know, that's, that, that happens. And that, I think that's what, what I wanted to talk about is the pushback that I get, sure, which actually reinforces the message. And it, and it seems to do that 100%. I, it was back in maybe February, I got a call from a regular, I don't want to say fan, but somebody who likes the work, who said, I thought that I'd, I had been beating up on the Community Foundation. Of Were Mendocino you? County. I watch your stuff. I haven't seen it. Well, I, I wrote a piece called Naughty and Nice for last December. You know, when, you, when you're thinking about giving this year, think about giving to these five entities and think about coal in the stocking to these five entities. And the community foundation was the coal department. And this, this, uh, this fellow who reads my work called me up and said, well, you know, I thought that was really unkind of you and really untrue to say that the community foundation isn't a real foundation. And then it sends a lot of money out of the state. And I said, well, both of those are true. I hate to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and the more we got to talking, the more he realized that what I was saying was true. He had, he had, he and his wife are regular contributors to the community foundation. Okay. And uh, I got to meet them. We you should <laughs> Megan and uh, Suzanne, they, they're all good people, but he, uh -huh. but he was told by the community foundation um, that they were told by other nonprofits um, not to engage Scott Peterson. Hmm. And I, he said, well, what do you, what's your response to that? I said, well, I must have hit a nerve for them to say that because if you're going to debate somebody, you debate them on the facts. You don't just do an ad hominem like that. Don't listen to this guy. Yeah. It's like, what, what, what is Big it about news. this story that is wrong? Because the community yeah. foundation has my contact info. I know that because we've exchanged emails. Something about my my wrong about my work. Tell me about it, and I'll fix it. I fact checked one. I don't know if you got the email before you came out. Which which about one? About the latest, about the very very latest article. I forget what the latest latest uh, one is, but um, do you remember it, what the, the fact one is called losers. Yeah, there is a photo of a girl holding a what you can call the dough. The photo is not Mrs. Peeler. It's um her daughter. It's not Maria. Not Marilla. No. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, and I fact, because I, I, I reposted okay, it right okay. on the Fort Bragg wellness page good. Uh, because I like to slather this information around, you know, and there's already people bent about it. In fact, the latest comment um, says the deer is a doe taken legally in Idaho during doe season. I, and I know, I know the lady so who wrote anyway. the comment. We, 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 t we talk regularly. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, my she's point, a good contributor. Yeah. yeah. I like, I like her. And, um, 
you know, her, her point was well taken. It was taken. Sure. I, I had never said that it was not taken in season. What I was mm -hmm. relating is my ethic, you know, growing up around here. I, I, there was no, if you take a doe, you have a doe tag. There's no doe, there's no tag on the doe that was taken. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to find fault, but I'm just going, if there were, if it was okay, why was it taken down from the Facebook page? Yeah. You know, and if the other things, if the Confederate flag from the Fort Print, Fort Porsche on the front porch was okay, sure. why was that taken down? It was like all the I stuff that was think taken it's down. Up now, I don't remember. You just drove by it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, this, it's. I don't care. It's freedom of speech. I choose not to have a Confederate flag on my house. Right, but you but know? but the lady who you were just talking about sure. and I have a good relationship, and and I when she wrote some comments that were I think uh, on the aviation, it began, "Darn it, Scott." And it was, you know, she was kind of upset about some of the things I said. She said, but nice catch on those numbers. Mm -hmm. So I, that's right. not, to me, that's not pushback. That's engagement. You know, that's debate. The, the, the pushback that I'm talking about is when somebody, and this happened with, uh, on, on Marco's uh, Friday night show. Somebody. Uh, recently or? No, it was, it was like six months ago. It was one of these things where he reads this thing. Well, I just got this anonymous thing who's quoting somebody else who doesn't want to be named, <laughs> who says, don't listen to Scott Peterson, ignore him. And probably something on the MS industry, the MCN. I, you I know, don't know, it's the, the problem with, with doing anything anonymously is you're always going to send a courier with that. Mm -hmm. So you're burning a channel whenever you do that. You know, it's funny you mentioned that it came from somebody that didn't want to be mentioned that wants to tell them, you know, because I watched the last planning commission meeting about the hospitality issue where the hospitality house is way over what their legal permitted you know, numbers are for right. beds, for meals, all this stuff. And many in the community would like to see them. Some, some are radical enough to say, shut them down. Others are like, before you change the use permit, try being in compliance first. And here's what I need to tell people about KNYO on this subject, because I'm on my show during those planning commission meetings. So while I'm playing a 20 or 30 minute set of music I produced on a Sunday um, as part of my tightly, as tight as I can produce a show, I'm watching the planning commission meeting in headphones for parts of that. And my theory is if KNYO, because our tower, our antenna hangs, we don't have a tower. It hangs from a tree. We are on a shoestring budget. If we, without telling anybody in the community, stuck a 200-foot stick on the top of our KNYO building down there on Franklin Street in the Central Business District, <laughs> didn't tell anybody, did it on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon, I did it, lag bolted it into the roof, let's say it's 50 feet, and we stuck a pirate flag on the top of it, put our <laughs> antenna on it, you know how fast the planning commission, the county, and the city would be red tagging like our front door? Like a duck on a June bug. Yet the hospitality group. When you say somebody is reading something for somebody else that doesn't want to be mentioned, I watch the public comment and they have a developmentally disabled guy who can barely speak. You know, God bless the guy, but he comes up, he says, I'm supposed to read this and starts reading Bible verses. What part of <laughs> this is really lame? <laughs> and why don't you guys make public comments? If you're pro hospitality house, stick to the point. Please tell the community why you should be able to go past your use permit. Not let's throw out by first of all, they're a nonprofit, it's supposed to be, I believe. Yes. Yet they open their meetings with a prayer. Yes. I'm not knocking that. That's what they do. But if you're going to cite biblical verses at the planning commission meeting, Maybe you guys shouldn't be a nonprofit and have a non like a 501c charter or something. There's, I don't know. And you know what? I'm a county guy. I can't vote on this. I mean, I have a sister-in-law that's, you know, one of the chairs of the planning commission. And um, I just really think they should be in compliance before they say, please let us expand our use permit. We're already doing this. And please, what would Jesus do? Well, you know, Jesus overturned the tables for the money changers. You know, so let's start with, why don't you guys balance financially, stop sucking blood out of the community's pocket, and get into compliance. Try being in compliance for maybe six months, then approach, approach the planners again. You know, because I know if KNYO as a 501c3 down on Franklin Street did a build first, ask for forgiveness later thing, really? Where would that go? Well, the primary purpose of any nonprofit is to fulfill its mission. 
Yeah. If you read the hospitality center's mission statement, it's, it's feeding the poor and pres- providing housing for the poor. Yes. They would do so much better if they were compliant and they didn't piss the neighbors off. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, that would help them to fulfill their mission to a greater extent. Right now, it's pretty narrow because what they're doing is pissing people off. Yeah. And the compliance issue, and I, I believe most of the people that I personally know speak with, uh, we channel, you know, comments around on For Bragg Wellness and stuff. Most of the people that are pissed off about hospitality, house and center and organization, et cetera, aren't so against that there is the facility. It's that they are out of compliance and the Old Coast thing, you know, I think we talked about this a year ago. Um, it's not so much that we disagree with the services that could be provided, but if we were going to put Fort Bragg's best foot forward for this opportunity, it wouldn't have been at the Old Coast building. Exactly. You know, it would have been somewhere else. Oh, you don't want us to have a fancy building. Well, you know, how about a fancier building that has a sprinkler system and its own parking lot already? It's down there on South Franklin Street and the deal was matched. The, the, it's frustrating. The the point of... of um watchdogs like sure. me and you and anybody any member of the public who points something out yeah isn't really to stop or start something it's yeah. just to make some racket when something's wrong you know and and it's like having a dog in your in your yard you know your 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 insurance rate should be lower if you have a dog in your yard well it depends on the dog <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> but even if you have a small dog that yaps a lot sure okay so that that you know it's it helps you accomplish your mission because it keeps the bad things out of your nonprofit, you would think. Sure. And anybody who complains, any nonprofit who complains about those noisy watchdogs ought to be looking in their own backyard to find out why they're complaining. Yeah. Because they shouldn't be complaining. They should be thanking the people that are the dogs that are barking. Well, and, you know, I'd like to see some of our whistleblowers on a national level be able to come back into society and be put into witness protection instead of being threatened with a life of, you know, in solitary confinement because, you know, they've exposed war crimes. That's, yeah, that's a big But that, that's just me. Yeah. You know, I've been there. And, you know, <clears> Obviously, this stuff. kind of rhetoric I could never work on in a terrestrial <laughs> radio station downtown and say these kind of things. They'd be like, Joe, um, at the top of the hour, you're going to sign off and leave. <laughs> It's it's funny. One of the um, one of the most recent uh, pushbacks I got was from a from a, a surprising direction. I'm, I just finished this piece called Redwood Bummer. Okay, <laughs> it's about the Enchanted Meadow. Oh, okay. Everybody knows of, here. It's it's all part of mythology now. You know these 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 brave Albion women save the save Mother Earth Earth from the greedy yes. timber people. Yes. Right. And. Um, I don't know how, I don't remember how I got started on that, but I was looking at the Friends of the Enchanted Meadow 501c3 nonprofit. Oh boy. And I saw that in one year, a third of their net assets went poof like that. And all of that is tied up in, in the property. It's like a, a forest, it's a pristine redwood forest and a meadow and a, yeah. this nice thing. And I, I was really alarmed, so I, I contacted the people who were in charge, which is this uh, lady named Zia Catalini, and uh, crickets, no, no response. And okay. I, so then I talked to. Well, uh, maybe the crickets are in the forest. I guess. <laughs> or, so then I, the, the only other person I know who was involved in that was Beth Bosk. Oh, that that rings a KZYX bell. Who uh, used to have a show on KZYX and sure. and uh, publish pl- published or publishes New Settler Interview and has been a okay. writer here for a long time. So when I reached out to Beth Bosk, I mean, the way I start my work is not that I talk to people and rely on what they tell me and go running off in that direction. Yeah. I look at 990s. I look at things that are filed under penalty of perjury with a signature on them. Mm-hmm. That's my starting point. So I took my, my, my case to, to Beth and said, I'm really concerned because Friends of the Enchanted Meadow lost a third of its net worth in one year. And they own forest land. Exactly. And that's all they have. That grows. And she said, whoever told you that is full of crap. And I just said, well, that's not a nice thing to say about your partner, Zia Catalini. (laughs) 
and she came she she came down on me like a ton of bricks and and I, it, there was a veiled threat that if i didn't shut up about this that they were going to sue me or something like that and of course that just raises my antenna sure to the story but i mean here's i i, th I thought it was surprising at first cuz here's a fellow journalist who i've stuck up for in the past coming down on me like a ton of bricks for doing my job and then i realized something we have a fundamental difference I'm an investigative journalist. Mm -hmm. Beth Bosk isn't. Okay. She writes interviews and she, you know, she talks to people and just, you know, different, different style. And obviously has a different investment in the Enchanted Meadow, but that there, there was a very just I, end to that story. A third lost in, in one fiscal year or? Yeah. yeah. Poof. Yeah. That's odd because trees <laughs> grow. You would think that there's some calculation in forestry that says, well, we went up 0.13% or, you know, 3% or 5% or something. They're with... not calculating timber value because the place can't be logged. <clears throat> yeah. It's, oh, okay. It's, it's a conservation, right? So that is based on a cost formula of what the property cost because Zia got one chunk. There are three pieces of property. Zia got one chunk out of a settlement with LP because there was a lawsuit between them. And then Beth got another chunk out of the same, uh, you know, same related thing. And then there was a third one. But um, that was all valued at a certain amount. And then suddenly it was like the value of one chunk of property disappeared in one year. Wow. But the, the justice is that I thought it was it, because I'm, my interests are a little closer to the people who have to make their living in the woods. Sure. You know, the, the the fallers and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the drivers and the, the, you know, choker setters and the people who work in the mill. Because that, my dad worked in the mill and my mom did taxes for, you know, people who did logging. My yeah. dad worked in Boise Cascade uh, before GP, basically before I was born. My dad worked in the Union Lumber before Boise Cascade. Wow. So, yeah. I was a, a, Back when the logs were made of rock. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> but anyway, so what, what happened, the, the justice part of this was that, uh, these ladies got this property in this settlement that was landlocked mm -hmm. and it's all, it's a conservation, you know, area. So they can't really do anything with it. They can't bring any equipment onto the property. Um, and it's bleeding them. Hmm. They have to pay insurance. They have to pay taxes on the property. They have a nonprofit. So they have the burden of the nonprofit. They have the expenses every year, of the nonprofit. Right. So, um, and now they have, a lot of windfall damage on their property stuff. They have, they actually should log their property to remove the damage, but they can't. No, okay. Besides that, there's a good possibility that some of those trees in there are spiked <laughs> oh, by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, after 25 years since it happened, it would be really hard to relocate those spikes. So nobody's cutting any trees in enchanted meadow. So, you know, the wow. ultimate, it, it is, there is justice because it is a preserve, but it's going to be really difficult on these, these two extraordinary women to really do anything with it. So in a way, you know, justice was served for the, for the timber people. I think. You know, the biggest kudos lately I've got to hand out in the world of like investigative and the, the journalistic slant of the North Coast, especially Malcolm sits through every Mendocino Coast District Hospital. Yeah, he's meeting. amazing. You know, and that's that's a bore fest because I watch some of them. I'm like, it, I mean, I am just like, really this, and they won't answer anything. So you can't go in there expecting like, you know, in 20 minutes somebody's going to ask a question and we're going to get excited or we're going to learn something because that's not going to happen. And you know, the thing about investigative journalism on the North Coast, whether it's sensationally expanded like some of our buddy Rex Gressit's work, which is fascinating. He's an interesting writer. Um, I find some holes in it sometimes. Or whether, you know, like you're the guy from New Hampshire, Paul McCarthy coming in and you're just, you're basically ambulance chasing and listening to the scanner and you're reporting all of it, yeah. no matter where you're at. If you report something that bends somebody backwards or if it has a family member involved, they can get pretty bent and you might get this big backlash. But then if you report something that same that that is really pertinent that 
people think, gosh, that was really important. I'm glad this was brought to light. Then they're, you know, I find this with the AVA a lot is people go, oh, the AVA sucks. They'll report in blah, 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 blah. But then they'll break some story. And it's like, geez, what would we do without the AVA? And it's this accordion-like thing where it's a love-hate and no article is going to rub everybody the right way. That's like the dog in your yard. You know, it's a cute puppy, but it <clears throat> makes all this racket. You know, I and, hear one in the background. Both my terriers are back in my bedroom through two doors, and I can still hear them in the back of my head. You probably hear mine, mine and my truck Maybe. out here. Yeah. Yeah. They're probably barking at him and vice versa. Yeah. It's like Morse code. But that's the thing. I mean, any, any good <clears throat> media outlet is going to produce that effect where you want to cuddle it one minute and kick it the next. What do you think your ratio of cuddle to kick is? <laughs> You know, I try not to. I try not to think about that. I, I know that I get enough positive feedback by email and on mm -hmm. the street, um, th and I and also I'm getting my sources are getting really really good. I'm getting documents yeah. really good. I got some great internal documents from the hospital, an internal memo that was a bombshell. I got great documments from Bruce Broderick about the Grange. Yes. And the autumn leaves uh, thing that uh, now the guild now the guild right yeah. well it's, you know the old grange new guild. sure yes but um my sources are getting better because of everybody not just my reporting but everybody you know knyo you marco you know bruce anderson mark scaramella and the people who interact and say hey good job scott good job bruce good job joe you know it, it creates this little community that yeah yeah, there's going to be the, you know, the accordion effect, you know, the, the cuddle kick thing. You know what I okay. found? And I found it mostly recently because my wife was coming home and there was a, a mentally disturbed gentleman hugging a lamppost on the Noyo Bridge. They were going to talk down. And I made a social media suicide comment I on, saw that. on Paul McCarthy's page. I'm like, and I believe it was something to the effect of just jump or get the hell off the bridge. My wife wants to come home. I caught so much hell. In fact, the comment was dragged from that page onto another social media page that uh, the Kohlberg girl has. The Anyway, it's a discussion page. It was dragged to my own Fort Bragg wellness page and had a nice long thread. And I thought, I'm not going to delete this because you brought it here. If you guys think it's that distasteful and online, I caught hell. I would say it was a 90, 95% ratio of hell. On the street, people laughed and I had a really good time on the street in person from my friends at Fort Bragg Electric, at Rossi's. I was at the National Night Out. My wife and I donated our tables and chairs and sound system for the National Night Out. And even people, I'm not going to say who, but even some city employees said, you know, I don't really follow Fort Bragg Wellness or Facebook that much. But what you said that day was really funny because we understand sarcasm and social media. It was distasteful, yes, but it was also funny. And... So on the street, I find you don't really get as much negative, but online, boy, the no face people or even people that, you know, will just tear you apart in social media. It's like that scene from Blazing Saddles. <laughs> Do you remember Blazing Saddles? Where, oh, gosh. Where uh, Cleavon Little is, you know, there's a new sheriff of, of the new black sheriff of yeah, oh, yeah. Rock Ridge, White Rock Ridge. And after some unpleasant incident with this uh, little old lady on the street, yes. she brings him a pie. Yeah. And then she says, you will have the good taste not to mention this to anybody, would you? You won't you? Yes. And, 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 it's and that, we it's, can't repeat the comments she said the last time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But, I mean, that, that's the thing. People will approach you in private and say, yeah, good job. But they, yes. they don't dare, you know, expose themselves yeah. to social media. I mean, what would the North Coast do every time we heard a siren if Paul McCarthy wasn't pinging it on a page? And many people send him a note and say, I just saw this happen, or here's a picture of this, and he'll repeat it, and it's really fluid. Now, if he was just to leave the area, there'd be like this media vacuum of the ambulance chaser short, of sort, and he gets a lot of heat sometimes. The, it's, the, the citizen journalism is so important <clears throat> these days. Media is so available for yeah. that, and it's so important. And I, and I see things, I would like to think that people like you and I have spawned this, but there was a guy, a new face, on the AVA that just in the last week reported something about the uh, Mendocino Parks and Recreations District and the grand jury report, ju grand jury did a scathing report on a MCPRD or RPD, whatever that is. New uh -huh. face, never saw his name before. Oh, great reporting. So I'm thinking that citizen journalism is spawning newer, younger reporters to replace, you know, people like us when, you know, we can't do this anymore for any reason. Some fun facts. Um, 
MSP Paul McCarthy's page has 14,263 likes. Wow. The following, because you can like and then you can unfollow. It, it, you invert the last two numbers, 63 to 36, and you get the following. So it's within like 30 or so that like but don't follow. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a ratio of how many people he's, you know, bent over some kind of reporting or something. Beth Bosk has 60 followers. Wow. The Fort Bragg Wellness page, I just looked at it today, as 475. It stayed at about 300 for a long time. Then some new events started to churn around city council, things like, uh, well, here's a fun fact, and I don't know if it's a fact. I just blew it out there that way. But at the National Night Out, in talking to some of the city employees, who I won't mention names, I said, you know, I'm doing all this uh, for free. Uh, the tables, chairs, the PA system, because it's a business my wife and I want to get into. And we wanted to network with people. We thought this is a good opportunity to do a little volunteer work. And, you know, it's win-win for us. And I said, well, uh, did you guys all get your wage increase or something like that? I thought the whole city was going to get 3% or something. One of the girls, oh, now I blew, I already took the demographic in half, <laughs> male, female. <laughs> I said, well, you know, the city manager could have paid us 10 times for what this rental would have cost with her wage increase. And somebody mentioned it was 8% instead of 3%. I don't know if there's any merit to that or if there's still ongoing negotiations. I know something to do with labor that Lindy Peters, our mayor again, um, put out on his Facebook page that there was a page in the Advocate that the employees put out there's this back and forth thing between Peters and the city employees, all that's supposed to be confidential about labor negotiations. I don't know where it's at, but somebody told me it was 8% for the city manager. I went, whoa. And I'm waiting for something to pop. I'm watching media each day going, when are we going to know? I don't get the, the super cozy relationship between the city manager and the Fort Bragg Hospitality House. I don't know it either. <laughs> I'm not really sure, but I talked to... Every city person that was a volunteer at National Night Out, I actually had, most of them I had conversations with, um, except for our uh, police chief and our city manager. And they stayed on the other end of the food zone. Um, our city manager, you know, went through the food a little bit and stuff, but nobody specifically came over and said a word to me, which I'm all right with. I mean, I didn't have any hurt feelings over it or anything. I had a good time. You know, there's a lot of people there. Um, it was basic hot dogs and some salads, candy, sugary drinks, stuff like that. Um, That's one of the costs of, of speaking truth to power is that some people <clears throat> will not talk to you. That's fine. Uh, it's like, you know, the old Pulitzer credo newspapers should have no friends. I, I Well, you know, your only friends are in media really are the people that are paying your bills, your underwriters, your... And I probably say things occasionally, and um, KNYO tends to be kind of left coast radio. And a lot of my Wagner Variety Show, when I get into my later hours, and like I have a feature called Time Machine News, which is a fake newscast. Lots of times it's anti-Trump <laughs> or comedic stuff about Trump. Um, it really depends. But the funny thing is my underwriter for the last hour voted for Trump. And I'm like, well, you know, it's 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 a variety show. If, you know, if you don't like it, watch late night TV the, or I think something else. The important thing, you know, when you're doing this kind of work is not to lean too heavily in any one political direction, but just go in the direction of what's right and fair. I like funny. I like funny too. And it's a variety show. So actually it's not real news and it's called Time Machine News. So I, I keep it funny, but I agree though, if, like, if I was going to do a legitimate newscast, it wouldn't be satire so much. Well, I think satire has it, has its place, and one of my one of my latest sources is is deeply embedded in the timber industry and a complete you know pro Trump supporter. And she just oh there I cut my demographic in half just like yeah. you did, just you know turned me on to a great story. And you know we she said you know one of the first words out of her mouth or sentences was you know you and I think a lot alike, Scott. You know, she likes the level of satire that I put into my stories and the, and the level of, uh, I guess, ferocity and straightforwardness that's there. I mean, call a spade a spade. Boom. Put the truth right out there. Yeah. And don't, don't, don't couch it, you know, just go for it. Yeah. 
Um, other numbers, let's see. My own Wagner Variety Show has 165. My Mendonesian Musicians Guild is 215. Doesn't really mean much. Um, what do you think of our local papers? you have any opinion? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about backlash. Now, the only backlash I think our, our core Fort Bragg newspaper has is lack of reporting, not backlash over reporting. Well, I think you're talking about the Fort Bragg Advocate News. Yes. Right, which which started out, was it was started by William Heaser of the Mendocino Beacon a <clears throat> long time ago. Okay. You know, that's when the Beacon was a real newspaper and mm -hmm. when the Advocate was a real newspaper. No longer are the Beacon Advocate. You don't know what newspapers. era or what years. Is this like 100? I don't even know how old this paper is. The Beacon was 1878 and wow. the Advocate, I think, was 1885. If wow. I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, one of the big pushbacks I got was from Kate Lee at the at the the Beacon Advocate because she was the editor there for a while, took a hiatus. She's back as, as editor now because Sharon DeMauro left. And uh, I had some issues because I don't know, I, I've never really even known Kate Lee. But there was a, there was a point in time where suddenly where I'd been writing letters to the editor and they got published, my letters just stopped getting published. I just stopped sending them in. And then I noticed that a former writer for the Beacon Advocate got in trouble with the local authorities and was arrested for battery and, you know, something like that. And their name didn't turn up in the court report. And okay. Back when they were doing the court report. And at the same time, um, you remember when the, the Yurok embezzlement thing, the Ron LaValle and that whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that that was in the, the Santa Rosa papers. That was in the Times Standard in Humboldt County. It was in all the newspapers around us, but it wasn't here. The only thing we saw was a fundraiser for these guys <laughs> at the Casper Community Center. And I, I brought those things up. I was on the local listserv for a while, and I, and I brought those things up, and Kate Lee came down on me like a ton of bricks. Wow. Oh, don't listen to this guy. <laughs> you know? And I just thought, wow, there's some real pushback. I must be doing something right. Yeah, you know, I, I moved back here in like 89, got into KDAC doing radio at 90, but that was adult contemporary. I didn't really do news. It was, you know, basic drab late 80s format carrying over in the 90s i thought our music was horrible um the only time i really noticed the advocate right when i came back was when heather drum and liz henry and anna marie stenberg were all running for fourth district supervisor yep i remember that and i was told hey joe go down to the red man's hall set up three microphones and a couple speaker and a speaker or something for their debate set up, take down, you know, and do that as a courtesy from KDAC. And, you know, Anna Marie Stenberg didn't really pull any votes. And then the, the vote count came so close that it, Liz Henry won. Heather Drum got a recount. I probably backed by, it was like a $60,000 recount. The Affinitos, I believe, paid for it. But don't quote me on this. <laughs> um, and the, instead of losing by like one vote after the recount, it turned out she lost by three. And that's when I saw, you know, some blips in the paper, but I've never really, I mean, even at KDAC, we looked at the Press Democrat every day and we would sometimes shred news from that, but we never referenced anything from the Advocate Newsy. And this was back in the 90s. They've just never really been on my radar. The heyday for me <clears throat> of the Beacon Advocate was, God, it was maybe around 1990 maybe as late as 1992, they were running a lot of letters to the editor that had to do with land use and deforestation. There was a lot of passion. And it was really a free-for-all. I thought it was really cool because mm -hmm. sometimes it would be like a full page and a half of letters. Yeah. And I mean, that's the first place I would go when I bought the beacon to say, what's happening? You know, what's this nutcase saying yes. now? And it was all these schadenfreude, you know, watching a train wreck. Um, and then I think it was a new policy. Something happened and suddenly that stopped. I couldn't get a letter in. I couldn't see the letters. of. I knew people who were writing letters. Yeah. And, and it was like that's when it became a Chamber of Commerce brochure, which is what it is today. I agree. Um, at the same time, then if in the 90s you were seeing all those letters, did, you know, did you ever pick up, you know, Marco does his memo of the air. Yeah. Reads your pieces. Yeah. When I can catch it, I end up falling asleep at like midnight, you know, know with too. my computer on. Um, I love his show. 
uh, Marco used to have his own paper memo, right? And it had a phone with an answering machine. And what the funny thing is, is you could leave any message. You could say some, you could talk a lot of smack and it would end up in print. And I would call, I would call and say something. And then my brother, cause we've always butted heads and then been friends right now. We're on about 15 years of not, we live in the same town. Don't speak to each other. Um, I see this post that's like, Joe, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> They're like, oh my God. It was just hilarious because he would print anything that popped up on that answering machine. I think like word for word. And I thought, that's that's pretty ballsy. I like it. How can you not like that? How can you not like a show like Marco's? Because he will mm -hmm. read anything. Anything. His memo paper with the answering machine was probably an early form of like Facebook. Because, I, I would have to agree with that. Yeah, because you could say anything and you didn't have to take it back. The admin didn't flag you or delete you from a page. It went into print. Right, nobody unfriended you. Yeah, my, my daughter, Phoebe, was named after a column in that paper. Really? Uh, yeah, my friend Jane Wagoner, now it's Jane Woodward. She, she used to be married to Jim Wagoner, who was a broadcaster at KDAC I a long time ago. Name. friend of mine for a long time. And Jane's still around. And she used to write a column called Dear Aunt Phoebe. And I like the name Phoebe, and that's how I named it my is a daughter. Nice name. Yeah, and I never even realized there was a bird named Phoebe. Phoebe Snow was an artist that I played at KDAC. It didn't really click, hmm. but I just liked that name. And uh, so anyway, named my daughter after a newspaper column. So you're pretty uh, politically active. You know, what? Tell me the kind of kinds of pushback that you've gotten on your activity, and you know what? Well, way, you know shape, what? One of the pushbacks I get is when Measure You happened. I thought, okay, Measure You. We had the Recall Dave Turner movement, and that kind of fell on its face because the votes, you know, that last election where Dave Turner was the mayor, you know, this is like two elections back for city council. We don't know the votes. We don't know how many votes for all of the, we don't know how many like Scott Mayberry got or anybody else that was running, whether they were campaigning or not. The county never released any numbers. And what they did was this was the first time that instead of like, you know, a short period after the election, we got our results. They waited the whole, I don't know, what is it, 90 days or something? I know it was a long time. It's a long time. They waited till the very last day to say, oh, yeah, Dave Turner's won again. And I'm wondering, who at the county sleeping on a flow bed? That's all <laughs> I could think. So there was what we call Dave Turner movement. Now, personally, I, you know, I don't think he's a bad guy. He's a good local businessman. I don't like his political activities downtown because i believe he's kind of the lap dog of linda ruffing when he's in the council just my opinion okay and, and maybe some people will agree or disagree then what happened is measure you respond because we already knew that there was this done deal as we called it done deal dave where there were inner office emails about the old coast project where they were already figuring out who was going to vote for it and they knew it was going to happen before it was even brought to the public so Measure U was born, and many now would say, oh, Measure U was poorly written. Well, you know, it was written by passionate people with an attorney that maybe doesn't write measures for changing public policy or zoning. Many communities have zones that change, you know, from light industrial to heavy industrial, from uh, a certain density of housing, they might change it to a higher density of housing to allow two more apartment complexes. To, you know, things change with zoning all the time. Now, the idea that Measure U would take a nine square block of the central business district, it's like 9.5. It's a, There's a little gray area there. And Measure U is going to say no more social services in the central business district, which by a certain date. Now, here's where the, where the political activities happen, where we go back into nonprofits and does your nonprofit, are you a political nonprofit or an educational nonprofit? Yeah. Now, Mendocino Children's Fund, Annie Lehner, um, people give me a lot of hell because every time she's posting about something, I say, you know, I think I'm going to give to another charity because when Measure You happened, she said the the... Venecino Children's Fund will not be able to inhabit in the uh, Fort Bragg Central Business District. And that's a lie. Number one, because the old fort building in the Central Business District next door to City Hall was being used as office space. I went there, walked around the building, could not see any evidence that they were there except for there were two IMAX, similar to the ones I have sitting in here, 
that were sitting on desks, didn't look like anything was even plugged in, no signage. And so I made some post probably on wellness about, I don't really think they're in the fort building, sharing it with Dan Hamburg or whoever our super, I, I have no idea. Apparently one of our other politicians is sharing that little fort building. Then what I found out was Kathy and Whitey, who I used to work for at Radio Shack 20 years ago, um, they have two big upstairs storage rooms in their, their, the whole upstairs of the Coast Hardware building is all of their back stock. Right. You know, right. doubles, triples, of, you know, extra lawnmowers, cases of motor oil, whatever. It's right. always been that way. Um, and there's two storage rooms that are pretty large. One of those storage rooms for maybe 10 plus years has been used for storing sleeping bags, coats, clothes uh, for the children's fund. And I thought, non-conforming. Any nonprofit that was already in the central business district after Measure U can stay. Right. They can also maybe even expand a little, you know, grow a little smaller, bigger, maybe even move from right. one location no to another. You're nonconforming. My argument was, well, the children's fund's already here. Why is Annie telling the city council that we won't be able to be here and we won't be able to help with the children in Fort Bragg because this nine block square will be excluded from when they actually occupy two positions in the central business district. So at the very last meeting, Councilman Lindy Peters, I like the guy, I really do. He says, well, I just can't see voting for Measure U if it's gonna affect the children's fund. I'm like, come on, Canard, yeah, come on, that vote could have been a lot different. And so I feel kind of shady about the children's fund, not because you know I'm against the fund, but I believe that the woman that manages the fund is a political activist using the fund as... Yeah, I think I, that's something that know. nonprofit people have to be real careful about. But has anybody ever, in pushing back against your opinions, ever you know, threatened a boycott or said, uh, don't hang around Joe Wagner or any, anything like that? Not, you know, um, when I made the bridge jump comment, there was some nasty stuff that uh, a guy that has a food page <coughs> uh, posted. And the funny thing is, is my brother and I, when we had arguments, you know, we don't talk to each other anymore. But there's key phrases, you know, from a sibling oh. or from a family member. Right. But when I saw what this other guy posted on social media, slandering it. me, right. I thought, oh, you're hanging with my brother. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, that's pushback. But there's a lot of degrees of separation. No death threats. I mean, I look both ways when I go through a crosswalk, you know? Yeah. Right. But, um, well, one, one <clears throat> advantage of, of, of pushback, and this was with, uh, with, with Bruce Broderick. Yeah. Somebody gave him some pushback about me and that opened up a whole new chapter, a whole new story that I'd been waiting for, but hadn't really gotten into. And that was a whole Fort Bragg mill site. Okay. And, you know, that, you know, everything, everything around here is connected to a nonprofit or to in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And so thanks to that and thanks to somebody who actually brought that to my attention, you realize that, you know, somebody said, don't talk to you. And I, you know, sort of followed yeah. the story and followed the money into a story that w would never have been amplified the way it was without this pushback. But how did you know that? Now, did Bruce say, hey, somebody told me not to? Yeah, Bruce named. The... See, I don't know because I'm out here on my, I mean, I don't even broadcast from KNYO. I have my satellite studio out here in Cleone. Um, so I don't, nobody's ever walked through the front door of KNYO and said, you can't say that on the air because, well, I was, are, you know. Because I, I have uh, Bruce, I was working with Bruce on one of the stories I was writing about the, the Guild. Sure. And, and the Grange. The whole, you know, battle. Yes. And uh, he mentioned this to me in passing that somebody and actually named the person who had said this. And um, I said, I really appreciate that because that really helps me to know, you know, where some a direction that pushback is coming from. Because yeah. usually to me, that's an indicator of a story. Yeah. So, and sure enough, it, it turned out to be a story that I'd been meaning to write, but just hadn't had the opportunity. So it, I think it's all good actually the pushback is actually a validation of what it is that i'm doing or trying to do and that helps me focus my efforts in the places that need attention i don't think people realize that the i think that different investigative journalists work different ways the yeah. way i work is i get the facts 
signed statements under penalty of perjury first. I have you know. the 990, well, at least one site, the 990 finders in my toolbar just for, you know, <laughs> goofing off. If I, I haven't had much idle time. My work's been slammed. I barely have time for doing my pre-production of the radio show and stuff this week. And you know, a lot of weeks, a lot of volunteer stuff. Um, which, by the way, when some people on social media say, well, if you don't like Fort Bragg and the way it's going, why don't you go to city council meetings and why don't you volunteer? Well, you know, between the time I'm on the air and my pre-production, it's eight to ten hours of volunteer time for a 501c3 radio station. And it's not a matter of, <laughs> of not liking Fort Bragg. It's like, you know, telling a film critic that he doesn't like film because yeah. he's critical of film. Yeah. It's not that I don't like the nonprofits that I'm critical of. I actually do like the nonprofits. I'm trying to help them by being a good watchdog and barking when I see something wrong. Well, that's kind of like why I bark. Um, there was a timber, a young man who passed away in a timber accident recently, and the Children's Fund was going to raise money for that. And in one post, I saw all money will go into our Children's Fund. Then in another post, I saw all money in this will go to this family. And I thought, oh, so are you raising five grand and are they going to get five grand? Well, let's say you raise $7,500 and you give them five grand, but your fund is still churning. Does the rest go into your general fund? Now, should I donate my money directly to that family or should I give it to Annie's children's fund that has this gray area on a post? It's a watchdog thing, and people rip me. Come on, Joe, it's the children's fund. They're really, really good. Well, that's... I said, wait a minute. After Measure You, I'm, uh, I'm keeping on my toes. I'm, my head's on a swivel with this 501C. One of the big pushbacks that I get is, how dare you go yeah. after this how, sacred yeah, how cause? How dare you? I've heard that. You know, <laughs> and if it's, if it's not said, it's implied, you know? <laughs> yes. How, oh, of all the nerve going after this, you know, the, the, the Mendocino Art Center or KZYX, NPR. How can you not love NPR? And, and I'm, well, it's not a matter of not loving the entity, but there are some things with it that need a little attention. And I am barking at the things that need attention. One of my um, peeves about NPR, it's not regular because actually I listen to JPR, which has different NPR yeah, feeds than KZYX. A lot of JPR, actually. And you know, what's funny is my daughter Phoebe lives up Casper Road somewhere doesn't have internet and so sometimes when she's around she's just bored she listens to jpr and i'm like wow my daughter's listening to am radio that's cool <laughs> for me i'm just kind of it's a nerd thing i'm so cool about that um but when i hear um you know they they, they have very well produced pieces on npr like on morning edition and stuff and when i hear them do like a 12 minute piece about wage inequality and stuff like that then the underwriter at the top of the hour is Walmart. I'm like, I, you know, I guess they can't say no to money, but when Exxon or Walmart are the underwriters for NPR, I, I'm just... Right around the time... Well, I'm not the, sure how to feel about that. It was right around uh, end of January, beginning of February, when a lot of things that <clears throat> were happening with the you know, Mendocino County Public Broadcasting that sure. I didn't typically like. I'd been listening to KZOX all through this, mm -hmm. and I just thought, I'm going to take a break from KZOX and watch MSNBC. Okay. And so I haven't actually turned the radio on for months now. I bet it's been three or four months. Uh -huh. I haven't actually listened to KZOX. And I find that it's better for my mental health not to. Because, you know, I just I react to a lot of these things that I've, you know, I, there's been so much pushback. Yeah. from the people at KZYX and the sacred cow people, how dare you, et cetera, mm -hmm. that it's just, there's a lot of stress involved. So not listening to KZYX helps me in my work because I don't get all wound up and distracted by this thing that's not worth being distracted about. I can just feel Marco McLean's ears burning going, why won't they give me a show? <laughs> <laughs> that guy, you know, and if anybody was going to leave KNYO, the late, the good night radio, even if he went back to KZYX, I imagine they'd give him a one-hour show or a two-hour show in the middle of the night. But, you know, at KNYO, we don't have our entire schedule populated with homegrown shows. We have some automated hours. And so when he goes on, he can stay on until 3 in the morning if he needs to. That is, the, Which is kind of cool because we stream on the web and you don't need three different frequencies and towers all over the county sucking up public money that gets washed when everybody on their job sites listens to a Wi-Fi device.
Right. And I think that's a, that's a big advantage for citizen journalists is that the cost of uh, broadcasting has, it drops every yes. day. Yeah. And, you know, that you can produce a show like this and Marco can produce his show and it can virtually be done from anywhere. Yeah. Marco claims $200 in a laptop. Basically, you can do this with KNYO. Yeah. He does his show from Juanita's every other week. Yeah. And it, you can, how can I can't tell the difference. No, I mean, you know what? I can't tell the difference from locations either. He used to have some dropouts because I think they were on DSL. And I think what they did, I don't know if it's in Oakland or where he's at, but I think they upgraded to a cable-based internet and his dropouts are gone. Um, because you do have to have a solid high-speed internet. Right. That's, you know, one piece. I had to fix our uh, internet connection because I had a bad, a bad, uh, a bad splice, a bad coupling. Oh. But once I, once I got that fixed... <clears throat> All my KNYO interruptions got, you know, solved. All my, my internet speed went up <laughs> yeah, dramatically. Yeah. It was a very simple fix. Yeah. But, you know, getting, getting back to, to the, 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 the pushback, you know, I mean, I want the pushback to keep coming because the pushback tells me that people are listening, number one, yes. or reading. Yeah. And that's the important thing. Um, and I think it, it creates an opportunity for debate. Like, why are you stabbing this guy in the back? Why don't you want to talk about the issues? That he's talking about. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, th these are sacred cows. Let's talk about the cows. Let's not talk about, you know, the grass or the Hey, shadow. the best way to get unfriended on a Facebook conversation is to keep stating facts. Because if somebody doesn't like your facts and they have something in their heart about a nonprofit, they'll be like, well, I don't think I can really talk to you, everybody, because you don't really understand, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh, I don't understand these facts either. <laughs> They're just facts. There's a there's a great new channel that I've been picking up on my uh, Facebook page, and it's how to spot fake news. Can you tell the difference between fake news? These two sources, you know, have yeah. .com .co. That's the oldest trick in the book, and others. And I find that there's a new level of education for helping people to identify what news is, mm -hmm. as opposed to things that are disguising themselves as news. Well, some propaganda is pretty darn subtle. Yeah, because I see people that are that I've known here since I was very young, that are, you know, my parents' age, but I've known them, you know, either working down at Coast Hardware, people that were, you know, senior to me. And I'll see a post on Facebook that says, share if you think every student should, you know, have the Pledge of Allegiance. It'll show a room full of children. The one black or African-American child in the second row back um, has the opposite hand up over his heart. The one Hispanic or Latino looking kid is staring the other way with his hand not even up at all, but every white child is in perfect synchronization. I said, that meme, <laughs> that's some product placement. That's like Cher, if you're so uppity that every white child does a pleasant allegiance correctly, and let's share this 10 times to every other Facebook because the two minority students mysteriously are not doing the exact same thing. and you know, you don't see it at first, but then I was looking at this meme and I thought, that's racist. What if the two kids that weren't perfectly white were doing this right and a couple white kids weren't doing it right? Nobody would repost it because there's, I don't know, there's, there's some hidden racism. There's some hidden agendas in a lot of this social crap. So when you say, how do you spot fake news? I spot memes that look like they're good hearted memes. And then I look in the background, I go, Hey, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty friggin' evil. Oh, and the funny thing about that meme, because I, I remember one part, I can't remember if it was the black or Latino looking kid. One of them, his shirt was like, uh, like black and yellow or black. And anyway, it was striped. I thought this meme makes it look like that child's going to get out of school and go right to jail. <laughs> and he's the minority. How come he's the only kid wearing stripes that resemble like a jailed outfit? And, and what color suicide vest was the Middle Eastern looking kid wearing? <laughs> I didn't see a Middle Eastern one in that one. Oh, okay. But it was a Pledge of Allegiance meme. And I thought, you know, there's more to this than just share if you think, you know, every perfect looking cracker white kid it has to do the Pledge of Allegiance and the minorities aren't doing it the same. There was one so, Facebook post that I saw today that threw so much red meat out there. It was, <laughs> it was, a, it was a quote supposedly from a senator that I'd never heard of that was talking about all the reasons that Obama and his family should die. And 
and it looked like a real photo of a real center. It looked like a real quote. And, and the, 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 the URL was policity.com something or I had never heard before. Mm-hmm. And all these people lined up. Oh, that's so disgusting. And I, I had to go to the website. Sure, go to the website. And do the about. And it's satire. Yeah. Nobody realized. I see people do that all the time. They, they put up something. The bait. And, yeah. They'll put up something, you know, that people are like, oh, like, there was one recently where the, a group of white kids, very, very white. And there's a group of black kids. They're all on some dock next to the ocean or something. And the black guys keep walking up. Like every few seconds, they do this little attack where they walk up and like start really shoving the white kid. And at one point, they put him on the ground. And I'm watching the way they're kicking the white kid. They're kind of kicking with the side of their feet. And then I go to the web page. Every other post on the web page either has a woman lifting her shirt and flashing her tits <laughs> or something just disgusting. And I thought, this came from a page that manufactures crap like this, and they put this out so that everybody that comments is white and is going to say, well, boy, I hope those kids get what they deserve because they're all black. And I, you go to the page and you realize this page is garbage, yet somebody who's semi, who I, I like is reposting, and then half the people in the town are adding to the thread. I'm like, this is disgusting. There are classes being offered by, by our European friends, the people who used to be our European friends, to school children to help them distinguish propaganda from information. <laughs> Why we should have this here? Hey, you know, one final thing because we're just about out of time. Um, this is interesting. So we talked about the dough was legally taken in Idaho, just for current events. I got you here. Um, somebody here says Scott seems to be tearing into Donald and his family because he doesn't agree with his lifestyle, making his quote story personal. People have the right to disagree with each other, but Scott, you went overboard here. Um, you like to stir the pot when you don't have all the facts. I do have all the facts. I didn't say that what uh, I, I'll, I'll correct the bit about Maria. It wasn't Maria. It was Maria's da- Maria's yeah, daughter. Yeah, it was the daughter with the, the deer. Okay. So. Um, but I didn't say that the law had been broken. Yeah. I said that according to my ethic, I don't care if it was legal to shoot a doe, to kill a doe. I would never do it. I was raised, you know, if it has antlers and they fork, you know, and it's deer yeah. season and you have a, ta- a license and a tag. And the first thing you do is you put a tag on the animal. I see a tag on that doe. Now, I'm not, again, that's kind of like a sidebar. Sure. But every other point in the article is backed by a fact. They all have hyperlinks. Go to the hyperlinks. Exactly. Follow, follow the story. Follow the facts. You know? Some of my nursing friends, uh, because you put up one that discussed, was it you or was Probably it? Probably me. No, no, no. This was Malcolm's article. Anyways, it was Malcolm's article and two women I know that are in the nursing, you know, business, either as home health care at the hospital, were like, well, we really, no matter what this says, the community really needs to get behind the hospital. And I'm still typing, please, let's have the hospital board be accountable first, balance their 990s, then approach the community about, you know what, we're upside down, we fixed our mismanagement, we fixed our holes in our billing. We really, really, in order to keep doing this, need a parcel tax. But to keep throwing a parcel tax at the community, hanging the, o, the OB ward, the, the, the baby wing, uh, over our heads, over a parcel tax, it's, it's kind of like when Annie lobbies to Lindy Peters and he goes to vote on Measure U and says, I can't vote on this because of the Children's Fund, even though they're already in the Central Business District. Here we have the vote or the idea that this might be put on the ballot uh, as a ballot measure to raise our parcel taxes over hospital mismanagement. There was a study done by Harvard University and the the doctor who ran that study, her name was Dr. Karen E. Joint, J-O-Y-N-T. And the finding of her study is that it's better to close a crappy hospital. It's better for patient outcomes to close a crappy hospital than to keep it open. That was in 2012. That's the joint that smoked Fort Bragg. Wow. Well, you know what? With that, uh, it's 550, almost 559. So any closing words? What do you think? Keep that pushback coming.
I think we should keep that pushback coming. Hey, safe travels push to back, Paul McCarthy of hey, MSP, yeah, heading man. to New Hampshire for yeah. some family stuff. Good thoughts for you. And, uh, you know, as far as media pushback, I, I'd love to have him here to talk about media pushback if you want to come back and do that again. I'd love to. Um, if there's a Wednesday where there's not a Guild Potluck, if you'd like to come here with Mr. Bruce. Let's go for it. All right. Well, we'll email back and forth, and we'll be in touch. As of this time right now, it's 5.59. I'm Joe Wagner. I'm going to be with you till 9. And this has been another uh, episode of Fort Bragg U.S. 